everybody. I know I start with that. It's such a boring introduction. I've got to come up with a catchphrase or something. Anyway, uh, welcome to White Line Fever Live and White Line Fever Kicks. And um, wow, we're actually doing these uh, episodes uh, more uh, reliably, uh, which which stuns me. I've got to thank Brian. A shout out to Brian Carney, who sent me a text during the week, and he said you've got to use the start of the show to sell things. Sell, sell. If you've got stuff to promote, use the start of the show. It's very nice of Brian to give me that advice. So. What am I going to sell this week? Patreon. Support the show. You know, we, none of us get paid. So patreon.com forward slash white line fever. Um, and uh, I think it's like, uh, you know, I think I think you get charged if I do an audio episode maximum of once a month and it's only five bucks and it helps host the show. It helps me, you know, pay for all that computer stuff that you need to have a podcast. Okay. Um, the reason I didn't do that before is because I thought it would bore my guests stupid if I just sat here and talked for five minutes at the start of the show. So, so we now cross to a person in Melbourne who is no doubt bored stupid. Uh, great to see his face and hear his voice, though, and I'm sure you'll agree. Jason Costigan. Hello, Jason. G'day, Steve. Great to be with you uh, for a bit of white line fever. <laughs> now, Jason... Um, I, it's hard to know where to start. Now, I'm guessing that the, the audience is is, um, is is a rugby league audience, so um, that they I could have done, I could do research and ask you specific questions about what you've been up to since 2010 when you um, left Sky, when you were the main NRL caller on Sky in New Zealand. Um, we know you're a politician. Uh, maybe the people who've been paying really close attention, you know, would have seen that, you, that there was a bit of drama along the way, a few headlines, and undeserved as well as we subsequently found out. But I won't, I won't try to fill in the gaps myself. I'll, I'll leave it to you, Jason. Um, um, since we last heard you calling Rugby League, what, what, what's your journey been? Well, I've been serving the people uh, in my home region, my hometown in North Queensland. Uh, I was in the Queensland Parliament. I contested four elections, for those wondering. I know it's boring politics in the eyes of so many people. Uh, Otherwise, uh, you know, I, I, I tried my best to make my community a better place. My love for rugby league hasn't diminished, I can assure you, Steve. And even whilst I was serving the people in the Queensland Parliament, so I wasn't going to Canberra in the Canberra bubble. We had a bubble in Brisbane before bubbles become famous around the world. And, uh, but I tried to keep my feet on the ground because, you know, most people say, oh, he's a good talker. I often used to say to people, in politics, you've got to use these as well. And certainly I did the best I could in serving the people as the member for Whit Sunday in the Queensland Parliament, contesting the four elections, as I say, Steve, winning three of them. And yes, we got beaten in the last one in October last year. And on election night, I made it very clear uh, in my defeat and my concession speech, as they call them in that profession, that I had every intention of going back to the game that you love, the game that I love, uh, the greatest game of all, the game that so many people perhaps watching White Line Fever love, rugby league football, and the game that, you know, started in Huddersfield in 1895 that's been good to you, good to me, good to so many people. And I mean, I got to see the world through rugby league. I've got a family through rugby league. You know, I've got my first home through rugby league. And I've got some great mates through rugby league, and that includes you. And uh, I hope I haven't embarrassed you there, but uh, I'm back I'm back, baby, and I want to go back to calling rugby league. I want to go back to calling the greatest game of all, whether it's in Australia here or in New Zealand, uh, where I have the fondest of memories with Sky Television, or in the UK where I called in the Super League back in the mid-90s uh, when I was also working at the Bradford Bulls. So there you go. There you go. You've said a lot in that one, uh, that one statement there, uh, Jace. Um, tell me um, about what you're doing you're actually up to now. You're not in politics anymore. I believe you, as I said at the start, you're in Melbourne. So, so what are you up to right now? Well, you know, I'm a free agent right now. I've had some time off this year and I needed some time off. Politics is a taxing business. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a mugs game, Steve, you know, and uh, it's a knock them down, drag them out stuff. And it's not sexy. It's boring for most people. And perhaps that's maybe why I didn't quite fit in because I am who I am. Um, we've always had a bit to say and we, you know, we did push the envelope and I used to speak up for my people and my colleagues in my own party, which was a conservative party, or at least that's what I thought it was. Some of them didn't like it. And, uh, you know, in the end, it was an acrimonious departure, uh, out of my control. Uh, the result, two court cases, or they were going to court, 
defamation cases. We were successful in both, uh, which I'm pleased about, needless to say, in clearing my name, but it didn't change the election results. So some mud stuck, Steve. I'm happy to say it. And we got flogged, you know, not as, you know, probably as bad as Queensland in, in Origin 1. We got badly flogged. And so once that happened, I said to myself, you know what? I'm going back to what I love, rugby league. You know, I mean, I called in my hometown of Mackay at 16, 17 years of age of the local TV station. I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd call an NRL grand final on television or a World Cup final on television. Uh, but we called there. We called in the UK. We called in New Zealand. We called in Australia. And I want to go back to calling rugby league. I used to write about it um, for News Corp in Queensland when I was a young reporter before going into television. And I miss the mateship that goes with that. And I certainly miss the adrenaline and the excitement of broadcasting live. There's nothing better than calling a big cup final. And I wish Cass and St. Helens all the very best for the big game at what I still call the Twin Towers this Saturday. There's nothing better than calling big time sport, including big time rugby league. Because as you know, Steve, it's been a brutal sport, uh, an exciting sport. And it's been a sport that's been sport of the people, whether you're on the M62 corridor on the north of England or on the eastern seaboard of Queensland in the city of Sales, the biggest Polynesian city on the planet in Auckland, or up in Papua New Guinea where my cousin Neville captained the national team where it's the number one game in town. <laughs> um, you're not really related to Neville Costigan, are you? are you? Neville's great. Well, put it this way, we're fourth cousins and we worked this out. <laughs> I've got to say, I didn't know about Neville because Neville's father is John Noel and I'm Jason Noel. But Neville's father came from New South Wales and had a long story short, we, when he got selected to play his first game in the top grade, I, I had no idea and I had all these calls saying, mate, what's going on? I remember I was in Auckland uh, on the eve of calling a game at Mount Smart. Uh, home of the mighty Warriors, the Vodafone Warriors, uh, and in those glory days, he heady days. And I, I had to ring back to North Queensland saying, who's this Neville Costigan? Because he played for Western Suburbs in the Pioneer Valley, uh, in the cane fields of the Pioneer Valley, west of Mackay. I didn't know who he was. And, of course, his mum, uh, you know, is Papuan, and dad of being Aussie. But dad come from New South Wales, but he is distantly related, and we are fourth cousins. Well, there you go. So... Jason, you're, um, have you started to put the feelers out? Um, where yeah, do, yeah, where yeah of course. The, where do you think the opportunities will, will, will pop up? Look, I don't know. You know I, mean, I, 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 I remember saying jokingly to Channel 7, Mark Riley said to me, you know, you know what do you say to your, your old boss, the opposition leader on election night? And I said famously, ding dong, the witch is dead. She didn't like it. Uh, and she said she's going to bat on. And two days later, she said, no, I'm out. But anyway, putting that aside, I said to Mark Riley what I said on election night, and he said, uh, after we done the interview live on Seven Network, he says, well, I don't know how he goes um, uh, calling the rugby league, but he calls the politics all right. Well, you know, I mean, whoever has got the rights to rugby league, whether it's television or radio, you know, I'm in the market. And I appreciate, Steve, in all sincerity, there are good people out there that have been asked to do a job to the best of their ability. Because I wasn't in the frame six months ago, but we are uh, certainly talking to different people hoping to go back to calling rugby league, whether it's bush football, big time football, NRL football, Super League, World Cup, whatever. And, and, you know, and I've called a lot of bush football and I don't give a rat's if it's the Cobar Roosters taking on the Maury Boomerangs or whether it's a, a flashback to Foley Shield in North Queensland or whether it's the old Bartercard Cup resurrected across the Tasman or perhaps the Northern Ford Premiership or something similar in the north of England. You know, you love your rugby league. You know how much I love my rugby league. And there's nothing better than being in that commentary box, whether it's uh, at the home of the grand final, the NRL grand final, or bush football, or anywhere in between, uh, and, and, and calling the game that I love and seeing that, that gladiatorial contest and, and those big hits and, and beautiful backline movements and, uh, the old chip and chase, all that sort of stuff. And, and, and I've been up in the Torres Strait between Australia and Papua New Guinea. I've been up to the Zenith Cares Cup, seeing our Indigenous brothers uh, and sisters putting it on, showing their magic. Who's going to be the next Matty Bowen or Sam Thiday? So, you know, Rugby League's got a great story to tell. And, and I'm going to embarrass you here, but if it wasn't for Pied Pipers like you, pushing the barrow internationally which probably leads us into where we're going after today's big news coming out of Manchester. The game would be in a poorer place and we need to keep promoting the game. It's got to be more than this club culture coming out of good old Sydney town. 
Mate, um, let's talk about stuff that is in the news since you've uh, prompted me. Before we talk about the announcement that the World Cup is definitely uh, going ahead, um, Queensland uh, saved some face uh, yesterday. I went and watched it at a pub at Good Street here, and the whole afternoon was a write-off. Um, uh, but um, um, you, as a, obviously looking at your uh, backdrop there, you're, you're a proud uh, Queenslander, even though you lived down in the Southern Highlands for a long time. Um, so uh, what, did you, what did you think of the performance yesterday? Did it really save face? Did it, did, it, did it mean that there's a sound future ahead and that Paul Green is, is, is you know, going to steer the ship into, into 2022? Great question. I don't know whether Paul Green will continue as the Queensland coach. I don't know if anyone does. And, and uh, but what I will say is that it was, a, it, it was salvaging some pride after what happened. I actually made the trip. I travelled thousands of kilometres when we were able to do that, for those people watching internationally, um, each of the states make up the federation that is Australia. That's been the case since 1901. They all have their own governments. They all have their own parliaments. I used to work in one, serve in one. So, you know, we have border restrictions within Australia, not just internationally, but within the nation. And uh, I went up to Townsville to take in that historic moment, that game. And my goodness, you had to pinch yourself from almost the get-go, it was, I've never seen anything like it. And it, it hurt. It made me sick. It made my fellow banana benders sick. And so we needed that last night. The game needed it. I actually said on social media, Steve, yesterday, that if it turned ugly like Townsville, if Game 3 was a replica of the series opener in 21, you know, you've got to ask not only the future of rugby league in Queensland, but the origin concept itself. You know, it's been great for four decades, hasn't it? But a couple of big blowouts, you just can't blame it on the new edict that came out mid-season, coinciding with Magic Round, with, you know, outlawing those high shots to degree that we'd never thought possible. But whether you believe in that or not, we just weren't good enough. Let's just state the obvious, Steve. We were not good enough. And New South Wales deserved to take the Shield home to Sydney. Uh, but I said yesterday, we've got to boost our player pool and that is code for bringing in more teams, and I say plural, north of the Tweed and expanding the NRL competition. You know, let's not kid ourselves. And I don't want to talk about NRL expansion per se tonight, but the Melbourne Storm was a Super League creation, and the NRL haven't created or put a flag in a market anywhere since it came into being as that first competition in 98. Yeah, the Gold Coast were admitted. The Gold Coast as a market was readmitted. And it's in Queensland. Last I checked, rugby league's pretty important in Queensland. Just ask the AFL, who've been muscling in for a long time into our heartland. Not just in southeast Queensland, but in southwestern Sydney and in other places. So it's not just a bias towards Queensland here, but we need in Queensland to expand the player pool so we have more players to pick from if State of Origin is going to be that showpiece for the game for decades to come. I'm not so sure. And that probably leads us into my view that we need to be doing more to promote and embrace international rugby league. That is the future of our game. We will continue to uh, be outsmarted domestically in Australia by the AFL uh, unless we get strategic and start going back to some of the ideals of the Super League era. That's why what Shane Richardson has canvassed recently in the UK, which you've been all over like a cheap suit, that's why that discussion has to be had because it's not just the problem that's confronting the game in Australia, but also in the Northern Hemisphere. And for mine, we need to have two U-Butte competitions in either hemisphere and more nations playing the game. It just can't be about, as I said earlier, good old Sydney town and the NRL. Anyone who's followed my career, Jason, would know that I've been all over it in a cheap suit. Um, Right. Well, I didn't, no, I didn't mean that literally. And I, don't, and I don't actually even have a cheap suit anymore. I don't well, have one well, at all. Well, I'm, I'm happy to ring Tony Barlow tomorrow <laughs> and put a call in for you, Steve. Um, the, big news today, 100 days to go to the World Cup. Tickets back yep. on sale and the tournament's going ahead, even though Australia haven't signed the, um, the, 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 the participation agreement. Um, it's a huge subject. And I, 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 you know, you disappear down a rabbit hole and people all get fired up and... You know, and, and then Australia and New Zealand might come, all the teams might be reasonably strong and, and we've all got upset, you know, for nothing. So I, I want to be kind of careful getting, firing people up on either side of that sort of um, um, divide, you know, too much. But um, 
I do remember, though, that when the last time the international game kind of pushed through with something uh, w without the imprimatur of the clubs and the Players Association, um, it was Denver in 2018, and, and the clubs certainly got their revenge because they got rid of the international window. So the clubs don't like, you know, they don't like being, uh, you know, uh, painted into a corner, basically, and they tend to have long memories. And I, I just kind of wonder whether what, you know, what sort of revenge they may take uh, over, over this, um, over, over being put in a position where they, they, they are going to be the baddies if, if, if things fall in a heap. Well, Steve, I'll say this. You know, I'm catching up with some of the nuances of the game and certainly the politics of the game. There are new personalities in the game. You know, and, and we've, there's been a fair bit of loss of intellectual property when it comes to the administration of the game. Let's not sugarcoat that in the last decade whilst I've been pursuing other interests. But from my observations, and you bring in Denver, and I did follow that experiment with great interest, particularly after the Kangaroos played in Philadelphia there at Franklin Field, what was it, 2003, four, and the Yanks came within, I think, two converted tries. Um, not bad stuff against the mighty kangaroos from the, the minnows, so-called minnows, the Tomahawks. So, and you go back to 1987 with State of Origin at the Veterans Stadium in, in California. Where was the follow-up to that? Where was the follow-up to the Tomahawks hosting the kangaroos? We've had a lot of hit and miss, haven't we, over the years? And as far as I'm concerned, we do need a, uh, a window for international fixtures. And the obvious place for it is at the back end of the domestic seasons in Britain and Australia slash New Zealand. The perfect world is that both seasons would culminate with the grand final at Old Trafford and Sydney on that one weekend in October. And then we move into that phase of international rugby league with teams touring, test series and so forth. From a television point of view, that's what the broadcasters want to see too. You know, like we Papua New Guinea, I mentioned earlier, where Neville and you know Paul Aton and Adrian Lamb, we've had some great stories that have got connections to PNG, the number one sport in the country, Steve, as you know, rugby league, and we pay them lip service of the highest order. We don't even play a, a Kokoda test, if you like, uh, paying tribute to the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels once a year. Why can't the Kangaroos be playing Papua New Guinea once a year on a home and away basis between Port Moresby and, say, Townsville, where we've got this Ubiut Stadium, or Cairns for that matter? You know, the, the, there, there is a, the, the international game is dysfunctional and what's been said in, in recent days. And, you know, there are going to be some fireworks here because the pressure is on Australia to send its best possible team to the UK for the Rugby League World Cup. And if players don't want to go, I'm going to cut to the chase here. I don't want to go given the, the environment. So be it. Someone else will be willing to take their place. The restrictions, as you know, you live in the country. They're being eased next week. But it's amazing, isn't it? What is really bad in Britain or what's really bad in Australia is very different to what's very bad in the UK. So we've got this imbalance, if you like, with the degree or the severity of the pandemic in our respective nations and others for that matter. And players, no, no one wants to get COVID. Come on. You know, no one wants to get any bug. Everyone wants to be safe. We, no one wants to see COVID imported to Australia either on the way back. But I know from what I've read that the Rugby League World Cup organisers are bending over backwards to make this safe for those players in the Southern Hemisphere who want to have this opportunity. No different to our Olympic athletes going to Tokyo and our Paralympians. No different to our Australians who've been gracing Wimbledon and Roland Garros. No different to our Australian cricketers in the Caribbean. No different to our cyclists in the south of France en route to Paris. Rugby league gets this opportunity once in four years. James Graham summed it up well a couple of months ago. You cannot have the event colliding with the FIFA World Cup next year. I'm so pleased that today's announcement has happened. And all roads lead us in James Park for that opening match between England and Samoa. Mate, before we uh, uh, say goodbye, I know it's late uh, over there, and I appreciate you uh, joining us at 10 o'clock at night, Jason. How has rugby league commentary changed in the last 11 years while you were gone? Has the job changed? Well, we've got a lot of people calling the game who haven't uh, probably done the hard yards. And you know, I don't want to compare myself to Ray Warren, but he's been the benchmark 
in the television era of rugby league in the eyes of so many people. And, uh, you know, you've got to be yourself when you're calling the game, whether it's television or radio. And I always wanted to be myself. Uh, and that doesn't mean you didn't look up to uh, X, Y or Z. But we've got a lot of people calling the game who probably haven't had the practice, if you like, of calling bush football, indigenous football, second tier, third tier, amateur rugby league, ARLA, Articard Cup, um, uh, Digicel Cup in PNG, Holy Shield, Mark Cup in country New South Wales, Northern Ford Premiership, Challenge Cup, whatever. And, you know, it's rugby league calling is something you, you need to be doing from a young age. It's like race calling. I never called the races, uh, which is a bit regrettable, I suppose. Um, my late grandmother, who introduced me to rugby league, God rest her soul, she was great friends with the legendary George Moore when George Moore was still in North Queensland, well before he went to uh, work for a bloke called TJ Smith. And so I never got to call racing, uh, gallops, trots or dogs. So, you know, rugby league, you know, it takes years to, you know, to, to be able to do it. And I'm not saying I was the best caller, but it's a subjective thing. It's not like accounting, is it? Uh, where it's two plus two equals four. Uh, but, you know, it's a subjective thing that you put your personality into it and your energy into it, your knowledge into it. Your ability to pronounce the players' names is a big thing in the modern game. Let's not kid ourselves. And also to work out where players come from and, and being able to be a storyteller. And as a journalist by profession, you know, one of those key, key, key traits, as you no doubt know, if you're a scribe, you've got to be able to tell stories too. So, um, Costo, um, I guess we'll, we will finish up um, now. We've been going for about half an hour. But um, where can people contact you um, if, they, if they know of a, you know, an opportunity somewhere? I mean, anyone from Gary Burns down to my, you know, 17,000th Twitter follower, if they want to contact you, um, where, how can they do so? Gee, you're putting me on the spot there. It's a bit embarrassing. It's like uh, uh, it's a free kick here. But uh, what you, uh, have you got a website which, or something or are you on social media? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, we're on. Seriously, we are on Facebook, obviously. Uh, Jason Costigan, political and regular commentator. My, my like page, by all means, uh, have a look at that. Um, we're, we're not too difficult to find. And uh, we've certainly been in discussions with different people. I, I don't want to um, mislead anyone, including yourself here tonight. We have been speaking to people. And, of course, there are good people out there that are doing the job to the best of their ability uh, all over the place and they're under contract. I wasn't on the radar, hey. I wasn't on the radar going back, what, six months ago. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've, we've had a chance now, Steve, to have a, have a good rest and spend some time with loved ones and family because and, it's very taxing politics. I'll give you the tip. Uh, and it's not for the faint-hearted. And uh, I'm certainly re-energised and ready to go and uh, more than happy to play uh, a long game before we get back into that commentary box with whoever, wherever. The, um, there's been, was some speculation that sports flick uh, were, uh, were close to securing the World Cup rights. Um, if that was the case, I would imagine, or that there's host commentators here, um, I guess they, they may just take the BBC commentary, but... Um, is it? It's too. The World Cup's too soon for you, is it, Jason? I know that you don't have to be even in the same country anymore. That's one big thing that's changed, right? Is that TV commentators calling remotely since since you were doing it? Well, that's right. I've only called. I mean, I called to quantify it, Steve. You know, I I, I called about 150 odd NRL matches uh, on television. I never called, including a grand final, I might add, but I never called one off the tube. Mm. Uh, I called something like about 35 test matches, World Cup matches, internationals, and all bar one, I was live at the ground. So just to give people an idea how things have changed, that one game out of interest came out of the south of France and it was the French versus the Kiwis uh, going back to the early, well, early 2000s. But my first international was Great Britain touring down under playing the Queensland residents in 1992 in Townsville. And... Uh, in fact, I was chatting uh, online to Chariots, Martin Afire, about that not too long ago. So they were, it's nearly 30 years ago, and great days they were with the Ashes series of 1992 and, uh, you know, the headhunting from the Pommies at, uh, at Suncorp. I don't want to fire them up too much before the World Cup, but uh, some of us haven't forgotten. But 
the game has certainly changed with people calling off the tube, uh, not at the ground, but I'm certainly available to get on a plane uh, and get my backside trackside for the Rugby League World Cup 2021 or anything that follows uh, anywhere on the Rugby League planet. Mate, you're so, so enthusiastic that I, if you were on that sort of chartered jet over here, I, I'm not <laughs> sure how much sleep the person sitting next to you would get. If you know, <laughs> uh, Steve, all in moderation. You know, I mean, uh, I've, I've been accused of winning gold medals, of a potential gold medalist for sleeping for Australia in the past. So, uh, you know, I mean, I don't drink Red Bull. Uh, I like my Santa Catrudis. That's a big red cow in layman's terms, but that's the closest I get to Red Bull. Um, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a big, I'm, I'm not David Boone on a plane. I'll give you the tip, but uh, all in moderation, my friend, all in moderation. So if you're watching this on replay, everyone, um, go to the... Uh uh, the show notes. If you're watching or listening to the podcast, go to the show notes. There's lots of uh, st- uh, stuff there that will interest you. I guarantee you it'll interest you. Um, and, uh, and and there's some deals. And if you like your rugby league merch, et cetera, go to the show notes. Um, okay. I hope Brian's happy that I've been more commercial this week. And I also thank you very much, Jason, for, um, for joining us. And good luck in your quest to come back on our radios and our TV sets. Good on you, Steve. And uh, look, Great to have the opportunity to talk rugby league with you and uh, looking ahead to uh, exciting times with the World Cup and everything that follows. Stay safe, my friend. Great to be with you.